you're Mrs. Stromsmo. To Mrs. Isabel French. Madame Blanche Rochon Charlebois. To say Mrs. Boschensky. Dear Mrs. England, it was with deep regret that I learned of the death of your husband, B67380, Sergeant Ernest James England. Private Waldo Ruben Stromsmo. Uh, Private Cecil Harold French. Corporal Suppléant Alcide Gassien Charlebois. Trooper Albert Adolph Bushensky. A86733 was his dog take number. He gave his life in the service of his country. In the Western European Theater of the War on April the 12th, 1945. On the 8th of April, 1945. On the 5th day of April, 1945. 14 April, 1945. On the 14th day of April, 1945. On the 8th day of April, 1945. For official information, we have received your husband died as a result of wounds received in action against the enemy. We pay tribute to the sacrifice he so bravely made. Hier op de Canadese begraafplaats in Holte liggen 1394 slachtoffers van de Tweede Wereldoorlog. Onze bevrijders. Moedige mannen die wij heel dankbaar zijn. Ze vochten voor onze vrijheid. Achter deze moedige mannen stond ook een gezin. Een moeder, een echtgenoot, broers, zussen en goede vrienden. Zij bleven achter in Canada zonder hun geliefde. Ook zij hebben een groot offer moeten brengen om Europa te bevrijden van de onderdrukker. Wij zoeken in Canada de nabestaanden op van een aantal mannen die op de Canadese begraafplaats in Holte uiteindelijk hun laatste rustplaats heeft gevonden. Well, the day that he, that we were advised that he was killed, I can remember vividly. We were sitting at in at the kitchen table having bacon and eggs for breakfast, and the whole family, my mother, my two two brothers, and myself, and there came a knock at the door. We all ran to the door because we thought my dad was coming home because the war was winding down. It was 1945, April 1945. We thought it was winding down and he was coming home. But instead, we got the bad news that he had been killed in action. It was devastating. And we all went back to the table and just sat there and numb. And then my mother started to cry and then we all started to cry. Veel Canadese militairen kwamen van het arme platteland om vrijwillig het leger te dienen. Niet alleen vanwege idealen. Bij Alcide Charlebois speelde ook een andere reden een rol. Uh, we moved to a farm en uh, he was uh, he worked on the farm and we we all worked a bit but he was the one that worked the most. He, he wanted to, when he was, he was older uh, around 18 he wanted to, to go and work outside and uh, earn money and of course uh, he, my father didn't want him to so because he wanted him on the farm so he ran away and uh, went and joined the, the army. Of course, my mother was upset, and us too, you, you know, you, it was just starting. Well, not it wasn't just starting, but, uh, you know, it was like a, a shock. 
we, we didn't want him to go, of course. Leo Bouvier koos er ook voor om vrijwillig het leger in te gaan. Hij en zijn jongere broer Morris gingen goed met elkaar om. En daarom besloot Morris hem achterna te gaan... om zich bij het tankregiment van zijn broer aan te sluiten... zodat ze zij aan zij konden vechten. Maar Leo had ondertussen een heel andere functie in het leger. Ze waren jong en zagen weinig gevaar. Ik wil niet lie, Maar... I wanted to see the world. I got to tell the truth. And that was one way of seeing the world. I don't think I was that patriotic then. I am now and I always was after, you know. But I think that's what it was. Who's patriotic? Maybe today, because kids are smarter than we were in my time. You know, we had better schooling today than you had in my time. And Morris really wanted to come with me too, to, uh, into my field too, but um, it was too late. He, he was, he was, he only w in the army one, uh, less than a year and he was overseas. But I was in, t in uh, Canada two and a half years before I went overseas. I got to be an instructor, you know, and, and everything else. Morris kwam nooit terug. Ook de broer van Jack French kwam nooit terug. Hoewel het leeftijdsverschil tien jaar is, koestert Jack nog warme herinneringen aan zijn broer. Uh, I remember with Cecil, I used to go on hikes with Cecil when I was a little guy. We were ten years roughly apart, but he used to take me on hikes. And I remember this one hike, we were on this escarpment, very treacherous trail, all of me and my cousins. And Cecil played a, a, a game with me. He, he made out, he fell over the cliff. <laughs> But he was actually standing on the ledge below. And he, and he, he said, oh, Jack, and then he, he went down, and then he came back, back up laughing. I mean, I always remember that. But Cecil always, it was games like that he played, innocent games. And, uh, uh, we, oh yes, I missed my brother Cecil. I, uh, I know all these medals he has. He, he, won, he won the wet medal for sh sharpshooting, and his team came out number one for sharpshooting over in England. But Cecil said of all his medals he won, That's the medal he cherished the best because he didn't, because it didn't kill people, he said, that medal. And he always cherished that. Eenmaal in Europa smeden de jongens nieuwe vriendschappen. Soms waren die heel intens. Bill O'Donnell en Wolf Solkin waren zulke vrienden. Ik was originaal in de artillerie, uh, waar ik een eerste lieutenant werd. Hij en ik werden eerst met het wat ik geloof te hebben een heel bekend British Army training camp, Aldershot. If my memory is correct, and we became very close, almost intimate friends, we made a promise to each other that if one survived and the other one didn't, we would look up the other one's family. And he said to me, will you please, if it comes to this, Will you please tell my daughter that I love her? So that was my promise. In the Algonquin Regiment, where we were fighting literally side by side, 
that Bill was killed in action. Waldo Stromsmo werd geboren in een afgelegen huis op de prairies van Alberta. Zijn dochter Beverly Penner was nog maar zes jaar toen haar vader het leger in ging. Ze heeft nog maar weinig herinneringen aan hem. My parents got married very young. My dad was 19. My mother was 16. Um, they had six children. I don't remember him going. I have very little remembrance of my dad except for one occasion I can remember very clearly. He was home on leave. He was because he was in his uniform and um, he was down on all four like a horse. And my sister, a year younger than me, was on his back having a horsey ride. Um, that's, and I do remember the day that we found out that he had been killed. I just remember wandering around town all by myself and going to different, why I did this, I don't know. Um, going to different houses around town and everybody being so sympathetic and, and kind. That's all I remember. Morse was a great grand soldier. His good-hearted nature and constantly high spirits were an inspiration to his, a great example to his whole troop. I didn't know he was in Germany until I got the map coordinates and then I went to see his, break, his grave. Yeah. Anyway, I got to this farm, and there was a woman there. Uh, I, I would say she was uh, maybe 52 years old. <clears throat> When we got into the yard, she come to meet us. I could make her understand, and she could make me understand. I didn't speak it that much. Anyway, we talked, and of course I told her it was my brother. And, and one, at one time I asked her, well, where's your husband? And... Uh, It, it was so sad, you know. She said, my husband is dead, but I don't even know where he was buried. You know, that really hit me, really hit me. Anyway, if you look at the picture that I will show you, she put flowers around my brother's grave every three, four days. And it showed it, I looked down and there was fresh flowers. So I emptied my Jeep, I gave it everything I had. So, but that was a sad day for me, really. Yeah, yeah. But that was a brave woman, I'm telling you, she was a brave woman. And I made a promise, I'm going to keep it. I told her that I kept his picture with me from the day the war was over. In all my travels, If I was working, it was in my, in my office. If I was retired, it was on my desk at home. But wherever I was, there was Bill O'Donnell. The last time I seen my br brother John was uh, in Niagara Falls at home. It was the day after New Year's. We slept together. And my brother Tony, uh, with three of us in one room. And at that particular time, I, I wasn't in the service. I was. I had a job and I got up in the morning and I didn't want to wake him up. So I crawled over, I was up against the wall and I crawled over him and, and, and uh, left and never said goodbye. And that, that uh,
And he went into Groningen. And um, I believe it was March the 1st and, uh, and on the April the 13th, um, 1945, he was killed. He was, and he was a stretcher bearer. Het was Fred Forbes' broer Arthur die omkwam tijdens een ongeluk in het leger. Dat hem deed besluiten ook hetzelfde pad op te gaan. Ook Fred overleefde de oorlog niet. Hij kwam om bij de bevrijding van Laren in Gelderland. Zijn zoons Kenneth en Larry eren hun vader tot op de dag van vandaag. Ik kom in de Redcuff Legion in Redcuff, Alberta. And I'm going to go by some pictures here of the veterans that went to war in World War II. There should be 218 pictures here, plus a few from the Korean War. And I'm going to go down along the line here and show you where my father is, his picture. And it's right here. Dad is buried in Holland, but with this cenotaph we have here, it is my dad's grave in Canada. And we're so proud of what he did. And as the community of Redcliffe are very proud of what they did as well. Of the of the 218 people that went to war in Redcliffe, seven didn't come back. I don't come down to this one that often. We have our own and we're about five hours away and we go every year to the Remembrance Day on November the 11th and have a family of 10 people, including my grandchildren, that go to these ceremonies and they take full interest in what we're telling them and what they're observing. And it's very meaningful and sentimental for me. Toen hij nog maar twee jaar was, overleed de vader van Albert Hunter. Hij heeft lange tijd niet geweten dat hij eigenlijk een andere vader had. When my mother remarried to Cecil Hunter, I thought he was my father. I knew nothing. And one year, or every summer for summer holidays when we lived in Windsor, I used to go to the farm where my grandmother lived. Albert's mother and dad lived out in between West Lorne and Rodney. And I used to go out there for the summer. But my stepbrother was never allowed to go. And a nine, 10 year old kid, eight year old kid, well, why not? I don't know. Of course, I rubbed it into him that he couldn't go. One year in 1953, I was out in the farm in uh, Rodney. And that is when my grandmother, Albert's mother, told me that I was adopted. And, <clears throat> and from that day on, I was never allowed to go back to the farm because for some reason, my mother didn't want me to know at, at that young age. And Uit de brieven die Albert Buschinski aan zijn geliefde Gladys schreef, bleek hoeveel de twee van elkaar hielden. Albert schreef zijn vrouw bijna iedere dag. Glennis heeft alle bijna 300 brieven bewaard en doorgegeven aan haar zoon Albert. Gee, it sure would be nice if I was home and you and I had a nice little home. And we are just waiting for Junior, which would be me, to come along. There's over 200 I've never read. I probably haven't read half of them. I get too emotional. And uh, he was a very romantic guy. They were, they were deeply in love. De vader van June Smith, Ernest England, zat in dezelfde carrier als Albert Buschensky. Beiden zijn omgekomen bij de bevrijding van Holten. 
Ernest verliet Canada, zijn vrouw en drie kinderen in 1940 en kwam nooit meer terug naar huis. Iets wat altijd een gevoelig onderwerp is gebleven. Whenever we would bring up the subject of my father, she would manage to give us just a very short answer and then cut it off. She, so she never talked about him or their life together. As I say, she was an angry woman, but she never let it affect her care of us and never talked about it with us. Today, I would like to have known a lot of things. And I don't have any um, letters that he sent me because presumably she would destroy them along with all the rest of her letters. But I don't have any, which is a shame. De militairen die wel terugkwamen na de oorlog hadden en hebben het niet altijd gemakkelijk. Dat was ook het geval bij Leo Bouvier. Hij vertelt hoe het was toen hij terugkeerde naar zijn woonplaats. Het was heel lonesom when I got back. I got back six months later, you know, after the war. So everybody, all the others were gone and um, got land. I didn't have nothing. I met uh, another guy who was overseas with me, a sergeant, he was a friend of mine, and we started to drink. Uh, but I got married within a year that I come back, and if it hadn't have been for my wife, I would have probably been an alcoholic. So it, it was a lonely time for me. You know, I missed my comrades. I don't know why I <laughs> let you guys come and talk to me. Anyway. <laughs> But I guess it's good to reminisce. Reminisce, and, you know. Uh, before my mother passed away, <laughs> an awful thing to say, I had hoped that my stepfather would die first. And that's when I would have taken my mother and myself over there. But that didn't happen. <laughs> She died first, so. I feel proud of him uh, because I don't think about the fact that he left us. He left us for a good reason, for his good reason at the time. Um, I'm proud of him because of his liberation of Holland, and even more particularly after we went down and seen how grateful the children in particular would come up to us and say, You grew up with a, a, without a papa, and they would, would hang on to us, onto our legs and squeeze us. And so many children would come up to us while we were there. You can't help but be glad and be proud of him having done that. <laughs> 